Yeah, bud. Um, <clears throat> Cyrus Sutton, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you too. Thanks for having me on. Long time. How, are you, how do you do in the afternoons? I had to get a cup of tea in me to just kick out a nappy time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've been on the siesta program. I'm down in Mexico uh, right now, so didn't do one today, but I will get one tomorrow. <laughs> Cool. I, without getting into too much detail, where exactly are you? Oh, uh, just, you know, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Do you, it's interesting, huh? The whole, like, don't tell anyone where you are, you know, like, it's a, it's a there's tricky a, thing. It's just, you know, I don't know. Limited resource thing. Are you yeah. in mainland Mexico or some other portion of Mexico? <laughs> other <laughs> okay that's enough info is this being recorded? If it, are we just talking or is this like being blasted out to the interweb um well both i mean we're recording this it's not live but this conversation okay. is the best part of what we'll probably say for the next hour it's right now okay. yeah perfect yeah just mexico some other part <laughs> okay yeah um i do this often with guests to kind of um, get the conversation rolling with you. We don't need to do this because we're pretty good friends, but when was the last time that you danced? Ooh, um, the night before last. Really? Explain. Uh, there's just this town I'm in just has a lot of live music and went out and I love cutting a rug and I did just that. So really? You, so you you love cutting the rug. That's cool. I'm stoked to hear that. Yeah, I I have fun. Cool. Um, let's go back a little bit if we can, Cyrus. Um, tell me about your formative surfing years as a teenager. Um, yeah, I just grew up. Uh, my my parents divorced when I was one. Um, so my dad took me down to the the trails south of San Lope. He was a nudist and liked to play nude volleyball and surf naked on the military base, um, would walk down and uh, surf Santa a bunch. And then mom was uh, got a teaching job in Long Beach. So Seal Beach was the zone. So between by the time I started getting really psyched on surfing, I was surfing up there. But mostly it was like weekends with dad. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, just trying to be like my pops and, you know, surfing was crazy growing up in Orange County where everything is such so much concrete. It's like right there is the wilderness, you know? Uh, so yeah, I loved it. And I mean, all the cliche things everybody says, it's always different, always changes. Um, I don't know what it is. Dogs go crazy on the beach. There's some negative ion stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, here I am. <laughs> but so, then, yeah. then I made a surf film, and this gentleman by the name of Scott Bass like did an article on me, and that <laughs> pretty much kicked off my whole career. <laughs> yeah, that was. How old were you then? That was a first of all. That was a film that you did with Rob and with John Pack, right? Or set, set me straight here because I I kind of forget. I was nineteen. Uh, it was a day in the life of five different surfers and. Yeah, just fresh out of I took I think I took like three classes in college and they were like film production classes and cleaned pools for summer and got a video camera and was surfing like the local pro tour and met and was surfing with different guys and got intros to different people and made a film. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you mentioned um Orange County and um I know that I've I think your father or your mother, somebody lived in Laguna Beach at one point. And um, that's certainly a competitive breeding ground um, when you think of, like I think of like Chris Morrow, who I worked with at Surfer and Mike Parsons and Pat O'Connell. I don't see you as aligning with that group, but is this something that you did? Did you do competitive surfing as a youngster? Oh yeah, it was all about contests. Uh, yeah. They were great. It was like, it just provided structure and I remember I was really I was reading my old journals when I was a kid and uh 
man, we don't really change, do we? It's so funny. I was like, so analytical of my surfing and had my like diet, my exercise routine and the things I was working on. And it was so funny. Um, but it just gave structure. And I remember, uh, I remember I used to love to lose uh, because it was like, I felt like if I was winning too much on like these, you know, whatever, NSSA stuff, you know what I mean? Um, that I was, yeah, I don't know. It was bad for me. I had like that level of cognizance at that point. <laughs> What, so. what do you mean it was bad for you? Like um, your ego would get too inflated or how do you mean winning was bad for you? Yeah, I just think like growing up in a broken home and having like a single mom who was a teacher, I just knew that whatever I needed to do in life, I needed to like take it pretty seriously. And whether it was school or I was like really into baseball, you know, before surfing and um. I had like a pitching coach and, you know, I was, my dad would take me to the batting cages and I was just really, I knew I wasn't going to get, have anything given to me. And so I needed to be competitive or whatever I did. If I wanted to do something that I loved, it seemed like a lot of people wanted to do those things. So, yeah, I think it was just like, you know, I had like an internal drill sergeant. It was like, don't get too soft. <laughs> yeah. Has that changed at all? Oh God, I'd be lying if I said it had. Um, no, I'm still pretty. Yeah, I still, I still keep going. Um, it's different now, but yeah, just I don't know how else to be. I like I like doing things that scare me. I like doing things that are really hard. Um, I don't know if I'm an adrenaline junkie, probably but in like a different way. Um, I think I'm just curious, really. Like, I think, I think you know, anything we do in life, you could probably attest to this. Like sometimes necessity pushes us to do certain things, but then there's like a beauty in the pushing and a transcendence and a calm and a peace from, um, yeah, doing something that maybe made you uncomfortable to think of in the beginning. And, um, yeah, so I think that that's like that's been the silver lining of all of it is I just have this like this liberation that comes from pushing limits and yeah, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned you were nineteen. You made a film, and um, I sense that you were destined to always be a, a bit of a storyteller. Um, for my generation, it was. Bill Delaney's free ride for others. Perhaps it was Taylor Steele's momentum. Was there a surf film which moved you beyond any other that was inspirational? Was there a surf movie like that for you? Hmm. I mean, yeah, there were a lot of different ones and it was more, I think like the, just seeing the different waves around the world, you know, growing up, with Orange County, it feels like things are kind of monochrome and uh, except for, you know, maybe evening offshores in the fall. Um, but a lot of gray days and you, you just see, I don't know, like thicker than water or shelter or, or Bruce Brown's in the summer, just people go into these wild places. And um, especially from Orange County where you're essentially on like this gray grid that just sprawls forever. <laughs> you're on like a microchip. <laughs> and you're looking at the, the the wild world and through something that you're directly engaging in and it's giving you feedback uh, whether or not you're fitting into that rhythm and to see that manifest through different athletes and, and artists collaborating. I mean, obviously that's enchanting. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, it's I, I looked on your Instagram page and I'm like, holy crap, this guy does stuff like you just get into action, you know, and you've always been there and um, you just do things. Where did you learn to build things like 
how did you learn to just, it seems like you just decided to pick up a saw and just start cutting, you know, like there was no school. I mean, we all have YouTube university these days. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I think ain't nothing to it, but to do it, you know, we can all, it's none of it's building codes and the way we build things these days is, is really fascinating. There's a lot to it. And it's really cool and there's a right way to do it and especially up north where i've built my place is a lot more uh i wouldn't say arduous but but a lot more um exacting in the way that you need to do stuff or else it's going to fall apart because of the weather and the rain but it's not that crazy like most of the materials we're not like hand hewing logs anymore you know yeah. uh, it's kind of geometry and i had a lot of help you know i hired people when i didn't know what i was doing and sometimes i should have hired people and i didn't <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I like to yeah. do stuff. Yeah. Action oriented. What about surfboards? Have you ever built yourself a surfboard? I did. I got into it in North County a little bit, but quickly learned that my friends were much better at than I than, and I could just stay in my lane and make films and stuff. Yeah. 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 And yeah. what about... I, I see here recently that you went to South America to go surfing. Tell me yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, that was a. Uh, I was directing a little a short film for Patagonia about um. Just it, the working title is like how to save a wave, um, and Peru is really interesting because it's the first nation to codify, um, or put into legit legislation uh, wave protection and that happened through a confluence of obviously heritage um booming tourist economy uh the fact that how to do it like the the local wave to um uh lima this is the capital and um, the, houses most of the affluent members of of you know government and the who's who got incredibly degraded because of development and a lot of people in Lima surf and they saw, you know, what's at stake when, when they don't protect the waves. So um, that's put into like, it's, it's created a pathway for these guys. Um, it's called Hasla Portuola and they worked with surf rider and save the waves and different organizations, but they're, they're putting together a surfers, like a toolkit, for international surfers to um, recognize pathways within their existing governments to protect waves. Um, and it has been done all over the world, but Peru's, um, I think they're on 33 now and their goal is to do hundred. So they protected 33 different waves in, in their state, in their country. Um, so I went down there to like storytell and shoot. And a lot of it was, they had existing footage, but I helped write the script with them and, um, then I got to stay, which has kind of been um, what I've been trying to do this year is sort of like a resolution is to like stay at a place after I shoot for a week, at least a week and just like have a vacation because I've spent so many years traveling, but it's only been for work, um, which is funny because people probably think of me as like, you know, I don't know, this intrepid traveler person, but I've always like gone there with a bunch of stuff you know boards and cameras and i've always envied the crew that can just hang out so I'm trying to do that now what does it look like when, when somebody like patagonia says hey cyrus we want you to be involved here um go down to uh, south america and 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 help us out with this movie i mean do you have a meeting with them and go well here's what my thoughts are and blah, blah, you know like what's it I guess it's not as simple as you just flying down there and just going, I'm here to save the project. <laughs> you know, like... no, I mean, it's, it, it differs with different clients. Um, and Patagonia is really unique in that like a lot of their marketing is around, you know, legit documentaries. So they have like a whole department, you know, one for long form and one for short form. And um, they hire me as a director. So um, as a director, I like to shoot and write and edit if I can, but with Patagonia, I don't typically edit. 
um, last couple of projects. So um, I just have a number of meetings with them and we kind of flesh out the story and I do um, a good amount of research and then meet, have meetings, you know, like we're doing now with people down there or wherever the project is. And then, um, yeah, I try to, I typically try to pick like different storytelling devices, I call them. I kind of have like a, a Russian doll, you know what those are, like those nested yeah. kind of thing yeah. approaches to media where I try to almost like make a teaser and then slightly longer teaser and then a slightly longer film. And they all kind of come one after another to like capture people's attention spans at the depths at which they resonate. Um, so if I think about all that and I, I, you know, I get heady in, with the clients and just talk about what their aims are and those kinds of things. And, and then go down and try to be in the moment and have fun and, and keep everybody stoked and do the job. Are you, are you constantly, I guess, when I think about it, I'm like, okay, I want there to be a surprise as a filmmaker. I'm like, I know that here's the script I wrote and here's what I think is going to happen. And here's the two, five talking heads I'm going to get. And here's the B roll and blah, blah, blah. But I'm always looking for, Oh my God, left field just happened. This came way out of left field. I wasn't expecting that. And that seems like those moments where you can kind of guide a story arc towards, are you always constantly on the, the prowl for something surprising? Um, it depends. Um, what you, was your, was your film between the lines? Is that, was, was that the title of it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a plug for between the lines. It's just like <laughs> one of the best surf movies ever made that I don't think enough people know about where, where can we find that? Uh, you can find it on Ira offers surf news network. I think you can rent it. Okay. So surf, the surf network. Yeah, I think it's called Sur the Surf Network. Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was an, that was an incredible film. Um, and I'm not just yep. saying that because I'm on your podcast. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that it depends. It depends on how long the project is. A lot of these shorter ones, we obviously are open to anything that unfolds and any verite we can capture. Um, and that's great, but we have to be completely prepared for having none of that and being creative with the storytelling and with the camera angles and the sh shot sequences to try to hold people's attention. Um, and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think that usually the way that I know I'm going to make something that I feel good about is if I get excited about the content and I'm excited about a lot of stuff. So it, it tends to work out. I mean, I'm just, I think that especially the stuff that Patagonia is doing is um, yeah, it resonates, you know, I mean, I'm yeah. not, I'm probably their archetypal consumer. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about this film about the Irish culture and that Gaelic language. Um, I just saw a little teeny niblet on your Instagram about it. It seems like this is a movie that you were like, cool. Like, you know, I've, I've getting, I'm getting a lot of editorial license and leeway here. Yeah, that, that was one of the, the later films I did with Guayaki when I was a creative director there. Um, and um yeah it was a uh, we we shot different music docs um the founder of Guayaki is a musician and is a like passionate um you know supporter of the arts especially music and in this woman is somebody who uh, pia um is like a opera trained vocalist and um so she she calls herself a song collector. She goes to different cultures. She's been to Turkey. She's been all over and like tried to learn uh, cultures through through music and through syntax and through language and which I think is a fascinating way of moving through the world. And um, you know, the film 
that had a twist in it in the sense that we um, kind of learned some history about Ireland that has to do with colonialism and which is like a topic that I'm really interested in. Um, so yeah, we, we were able to kind of have a little twist in there and kind of talk about some things that made the film, I think actually not releasable for a while. <clears throat> And then now we felt like now was the time we finished it a while ago and kind of sat on it through COVID and a lot of that stuff. So. Hmm, that's interesting. It was, it was not releasable because the content was too spicy. Well, I think it, it just, mm, um, the message of the film sort of taps into the cyclical nature of colonialism and displacement and kind of trauma that most people in the West are dealing with at some level. And I think that it was the, you know, the attention during COVID was a lot on um, like creating equity and Black Lives Matter and that kind of thing. And we felt like, you know, from a white key brand standpoint that turning the narrative on, you know, white people being colonized and, um, you know that, that that kind of broadening the lens at a time that our 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 zeitgeist had gotten uh, very specific was maybe not um, the most mm -hmm. polished way of moving forward. Wow, look at you! You're quite the diplomat these days, too. I get what you're saying. Um, you're basically saying it might not have been the best time to market a film about that specific group of people yeah i mean i feel like we all have to be pretty diplomatic these days and there's a lot of um, people have a lot of people are trying to grasp what's going on in the world you know and there's a lot of um a lot of pain so yeah tell me about um uh native americans what are your thoughts on Native Americans. I know that's a broad friggin' subject. <laughs> I, I bring it up because we just had this feature film and great book. And I've just finished a couple of other books. Is this a, I guess, let me ask you, I'll ask it like this. Is this something you, you've you done films on before, documentaries or whatever? Have you been creative with this concept, this idea? Uh, and if not, is this something that that interests you? Well, I mean, to answer your question, yes. Um, I work with an organization called Indigenous Regeneration based in San Diego. Um, and my friend Lacey Cannon runs that. Um, I did a number of projects with them last year. Um, yeah, I mean, where do you want to, I mean, you, just, you know, the, I don't people know. Of Turtle, the people of Turtle Island have been here a long time. And, um, you know, we came here to um, escape persecution and basically colonialism from Europe and resource extraction and cultural displacement. And we took a lot of that sort of grit and determination to kind of cleave a new way for ourselves and sort of guns germed and, and steeled it, but then also brought a lot of different species over which changed the landscape. Um, that the native people, you know, <clears throat> continue to um, have relationships with. And so it's changed a lot of their home and we're here and um, yeah, we've, which this is the latest machination in a long line of displacement and um, yeah. <laughs> Do you think from a 30,000 foot level, it's just, it's just something that's happened in human civilization forever. And it's just, like you say, a machination, you know, like colonialism or hegemony in some form has just been, it's been a constant of the selfish nature of the human species. Um, I don't think so. I think that 98% of our earthly tenure as homo sapiens, we've lived um, in pretty egalitarian societies uh the davids might 
disagree with their new book that I have a book club uh, with my buddies on. Um, but what's the name of the book? It's called The Dawn of Everything. It's really cool. It it sort of is a bit of a takedown of a lot of the big history books like Yuval Harari Sapiens or mm -hmm. Jared Diamond Guns, Germs and Steel or Collapse. And it mm -hmm. but they create a lot of straw men for their argument and they kind of make up a lot of stuff and they ignore a lot of anthropology um pre nineteen seventies kind of stuff. It probably would have flown flown, but they ignore a lot of the development since then and try to expand things that aren't really the consensus in the scientific community or in, in at least in the anthropological community so i mean obviously this is something i'm super passionate about like this is what i nerd out on all the time is like political theory anthropology how we got here um um so i mean i don't uh, colonialism i think is something that is I'm so deep in this, it's hard to like not like side swipe this show and talk about it for an hour or two because that's what I do with my friends. So I don't, I mean, Go basically, ahead. dude, I don't care. I'm more <laughs> interested in this than surfing, believe me. Same. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, okay, well, so in the, in the Ice Age, we were primarily immediate return hunter gatherer societies, which have been associated with the most egalitarian kinds of societies, um, groups of people, bands. We were mostly bands. We weren't even tribes. We, they, they, um, anthropologists, the consensus in, within anthropology is that we weren't patrilineal or matrilineal. We didn't pray to our ancestors. It was, we didn't have, we had very loose affiliation with gods and religion. Um, but the beginning of the Holocene, the climate stabilized, um, and there became increasingly um, common for us to be delayed return hunter gatherers with different kinds of uh, horticulture um, in which we would, you know, spread seeds of some tobacco that we liked or um, medicine or fuel or fiber or shelter or you know, entertainment crops. Um, but those immediate, those delayed return society started to become a little more hierarchical um things really kicked off in the indus valley um and you know in mesopotamia and the tailwaters of the colorado which was the hopi and the Dene and the yangtze river valley kind of all at the same time and that was because the holocene sort of like stabilized things and it created um really consistent floodplains from the glacial retreats and that like all of a sudden like vastly expanded your ability to practice agriculture um a lot of the early agricultural societies weren't inherent inherently hierarchical um they they happened on things called turtlebacks there's this anthropologist i'm forgetting his name finnish guy who postulated that there was like a climatic change like a climate change event that lasted a number of like a few hundred years that created droughts and then compacted people um, between these turtleback who basically lived on like perennial islands in the middle of a floodplain that they could walk across sometimes and then the, in the flood season. But the reason people practice agriculture at a larger scale and it increased population density is because, is because hunter gatherers would have to like, they would really limit their population size because of they needed to travel a lot. Um, so women would have kids, they'd practice different forms of infanticide. And they would have kids every like four years on average, maybe three or four, I think. And all of a sudden with agriculture, you're sedentary, you have more kids. Um, this climatic change event introduced um, irrigation, which that was again the tipping point of having slaves and having a class system and building walls to keep people in as much as to keep people out. Uh, you were creating more people, you're creating more work. And that started like this sort of diminishing return situation of resource extraction, expansion, war. Um, the very few examples of actual war um, create this specific kind of toy poodle form of agriculture. Because agriculture is so broad, broad, and we think of you know agriculture as being this monolith, but it's really this usually grain, um, ones that are based, agricultural systems that are based on root crops, um, 
in the tropics or subtropics or harvestable all year, therefore like less taxable. But when you have a grain in a temperate zone that can be like patrolled by the leader, um, then you're you're really creating hierarchy. You're setting up, you know, more and more robust forms. Uh, we think of history as this is it's, there's like a, this notion of stagism in which we think that things were always a certain way, but then also things have gotten more, we've progressed for better or worse, we've progressed. And a lot of us sort of swallow the notion of like the Hobbesian view that life was nasty, brutish and short, or the Rousseauian view that, you know, we were these innocent sort of hunter gatherers and life was simple, but now things have gotten more complex. Things are just the way they are. Um, but if you look at history, like people dove into agriculture, they bailed, they went back to hunting and gathering. It's sort of common knowledge within the anthropological community that hunting and gathering was like the shit, right? That's why like a lot of people want to do it now. Everybody wants to be a hunter gatherer and they worked very little. Um, they had a lot of time for leisure and arts and things and depending on the, the bioregion, um, but it was a much better lifestyle. So they would like people primarily throughout time would return to a, a simpler situation. Um, the One of the, regardless of their practicing nomadic pastoralism, different forms of hunter-gatherism, horticulture, um, agriculture, sort of the constant in all of that is the ability to walk away. Um, say you have a king that's too big for its britches or a chief that's trying to have sex with your daughter or something that you're not down with. If you had the ecological literacy to bail and like live on the land, at least until you found another group. Um, and you also had access to like pointy sharp tip weapons and your daughter does too. And you all hunt and, um, it's, a, it's something called like a reverse dominance hierarchy theory. And so that really selectively called the alpha males um, by and large from societies all over the world where if somebody got, you, could, you can only coerce people so much if they don't need you. And it's as soon as we become beholden to agriculture and increasingly desertified areas in the Holocene that were river valleys, um, the scarcity mindset that that created, a lot of the depletion of soil um, and trees that civilizations that grew up out of agriculture because of the amount of population allowed to grow, the resource extraction created less rain, created less resources, created scarcity, and allowed people to, or, or didn't allow people to say, you know, get out of here, or I'm bailing. Um, so we were all native to some place. Um, uh you know ireland was colonized the the, the great famine with which 1.3 mil, 1 million people emigrated across you know to the different commonwealth nations um that was a forced starvation you know, a lot of that was like a lot of those fields were you know food is being exported out, back to europe and that, that number of people didn't was it definitely was exacerbated by a, a heavy colonial component and um you know, the people of England were tribes before that, you know, and then they got colonized. And mm -hmm. um, so it's just sort of this, this thing and it works. And I think our brains are hardwired to create patterns out of chaos. And we want to organize things in order to mitigate um, from catastrophes or abnormalities in climate. So we're trying to constantly try to control and sculpt our environments and it seems like deep history shows that um we organize chaos until it becomes a barrel and it becomes really beautiful and then it crashes into white water and starts all over again uh, and i think we're kind of in that moment right now holy mackerel <laughs> you're, bringing, you're bringing some major some major stuff there i'm in awe of uh, your knowledge of it all do you listen by chance to um, Dan Carlin? Dan Carlin's Hardcore 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 Hardcore. Hardcore. Yeah, I was really, uh, I was a big fan of those. I think it's, he's really cool in the sense that he's like just this magnanimous storyteller, right? He's just, 
yeah he's got the voice and he, you yeah. know it's a uh, blood and gore and i think a lot of what the zeitgeist around what he shares is like life was freaking gnarly and like yeah. be stoked and be prepared and also don't take anything for granted um i've since one, kind of the, of, one, of, one of the great things he does as you know is he'll cite sources um as much as he can real um you know first primary sourcing and yeah. for instance if he's talking about people of the step he won't he won't just talk about one person's point of view but he'll get all 15 20 different people's points of view and then try to crystallize some reality out of it rather than just take the you know the guy who won the war's version of what happened and i love his critiques of the sources you know like well this guy was kind of an alcoholic it seemed like or like the, you know the a lot of the stuff was intranslatable because this text was like burned half or, you know, somebody spilt wine on this page or, um, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's pretty cool. I, I, I have a bit of an issue. I, I'm becoming, I mean, I'm forming, starting to form a little bit of my own opinion around it. I'm being very careful to limit my, um, open minded. I'm very, very young at it. And I know there's yeah. so much more to learn, but, um, from what I am learning and starting, it seems like what he, the zeitgeist around like what he shares is very much of like an, the empire, the the clashes, the wars. And I think we all grew up with history books that sort of talk about, you know, the beginning of thought and philosophy or like the stem from the first major empires, like Greece, the Western empires, Greece and Rome. And maybe there's Confucius thrown in there. Um, but like, and then everything is about like progress and civilization and the wars that have been fought. And it's kind of like anything that happens in between is like the dark ages or um, it's it's primitive. And I, I'm really fascinated by what happens in those dark ages and what what is being done by the quote unquote primitive people. Because mm -hmm. I think it really steers our minds towards this um, illusion of progress and also this... Um, that Hobbesian narrative that like before or Rousseauian, like we were either innocent or. Well, like, let suffering. me ask, let me, let me challenge you or ask you this yeah. in these little spaces that you speak of between sort of big, what, well, for lack of a better phrase, large moments in history that, that you say that, which are correct or that we sort of pin on the timeline as important features on the timeline or these war moments, but these, these moments that you're intrigued by that are in between that aren't necessarily excavated. Um, assuming a lot of good stuff happened there, but didn't get told about it. Um, it seems like that good stuff was so good that at some point, one group of people said, Hey, let's go get that. And they had the warring ability to go mm -hmm. and not only take that resource that this, that the sort of utopian civilization or group of people or whatever built up arts and culture. We don't really know, right? Because it's these little dark moments in history, but somebody goes, that stuff's good. Let's go get it. And they had the, the warring ability to go and take it. And not only that, but smash whatever culture was there and sort of stamp it out. And, and I think that's why these, these warring moments on our timeline uh, are on our timeline because it's he, Dan's big into, you know, the victor is the one who gets to tell history. Yeah, no, I agree. I just, I would challenge you that for the vast majority of homo sapiens existing on earth, that was not the paradigm. And because we are on the Everest of the largest, most destructive and amazing and powerful empire ever arguably um for our time that we think that's like that's like that always happens but i think that if you if you look at um the way nature works and like the way we're involved with nature that it it, it decomposes and dematerializes much more than it organizes into um a post-war clean slate or uh, 
a very hierarchical, clean, organized, regimented structure. So I don't, I think history is on my side when I say that I think, yeah, I mean, you can sub celebrate those things, but they're anomalies, you know, it's not, it's not actually culture. It's not actually, um, it's a, oftentimes wars are like a displacement of culture mm -hmm. and a creation of purity, but nature abhors a vacuum and diversity equals security in nature and diversity means um, usually pretty low tech kind of rootsy stuff. Yeah. You know, in many ways, as I sit here and think about it, your transitory nature, your, your trans, your movement from Laguna beach, from orange County to the Pacific Northwest, it's almost like you're embodying this. You're sort of living this. I don't know about that. I think, um, maybe, but it's also, Colonial. Well, let me just say that it was surprising to me that you moved to the Pacific Northwest. Not really. Like I could see Cyrus moving to the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> but you just friggin' did it. Like you just went and did it. And before you know it, you're building this home and you're doing this stuff that's like in my mind, I'm like bowing down, going, Holy mackerel, this guy is amazing. Like that he's just doing this stuff. So I'll that's the end of my interruption. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just I I I look at the amount of systems that have to work in order for Southern California to enjoy the lifestyle that is enjoyed. And the more I dug into steel reinforced concrete, Army Corps of Engineer, like deep on engineering reddits and looked at the proposed lifespans of our bridges and our roads and our dams and our nuclear plants and all the things, aqueducts, um, from, you know, water desertification, lack of scientific proliferation beyond 20 years, scholarly papers around transpiration and what we've done to the Central Valley. Like, I just, it just doesn't seem. So should like we be following you? Or just, it feels like you're like, I'm getting the hell out of here. This place is about to go to hell. <laughs> oh, it feels like, man. you know, something I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just know that. Um, <laughs> You know, it's 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 all good, but uh, I just feel like, yeah, there's just a few less variables there for me, and I can kind of, I don't know, man. Yeah, you're an amazing guy. You know, I'm so fascinated by you. Sometimes I, I, not so much now, but in the past, I would sort of follow you, and I felt like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders, like you were just like it felt like you had to solve, you were out to solve every friggin' problem, you know? And, and is that a correct uh, characterization of you? Oh man, nothing's changed. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how to, I mean, why not? Right. I mean, we have act unparalleled access to information. Why isn't I, I, I trip out on like, why isn't everybody doing everything they can to and give what our what is your answer to that why aren't why aren't we? i cannot speak for anybody else it just makes me super bummed out if it seems I... kind of hobbesian though doesn't it <laughs> i love it um you know it's my yoke to bear and i just find that you know to get psych to psychoanalyze myself i think that I'm a pretty sensitive person and I care a lot about people and I feel like I've always been kind of like an outcast in a way. My dad was adopted. Um, I'm an only child, like retreating into this like bigger world in which I can try to understand and like provide. And I think also my brain, I mean, I'm probably, neurodivergent you know slightly autistic in a way and so my brain um i have a hard time like with certain social cues and just like chumming it up and i i try to figure and i think that's part of being neurodivergent is like you have you start trying to figure out like deeper things that are going on like why people are doing what they're doing or so i'm always like looking for the source and um just makes me stoked to nerd out on something and go surfing and um yeah, like balancing it out with just being in nature and 
playing music with my friends and talking about stuff. Uh, this seems like the best stuff to talk about. <laughs> what about family? Yeah, my mom's here in Mexico with me. No, no, no. You creating a family. <laughs> yeah, I'm down. Um, I've kind of like wanted to do it in a certain way. And I've set up my life to do it in a way that I would feel good about. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't take that lightly. You know, having kids, I don't, I want to be, uh, yeah, I guess in general in life, I just like try to be careful about what I create and the implications of those things. And kids yeah. are probably the biggest thing we do. So yeah, I don't know, you got any tips? <laughs> I, I don't. Um, I think you will be a great father, though. In fact, I know you would be a great father. Um, I just... It, it's interesting to me because because I sense that you have such strong uh, convictions about the world that that um, like I, I'm I meant I'm anticipating you like homeschooling your kid and setting up this like perfect system and then him just going hey dad fuck you I want to go to the skate park in Orange County <laughs> and just like ruining the whole fucking thing that we set up for him you know or her oh yeah. No, I I don't think I'm going to be the Captain Fantastic dad in that regard. I think uh, anybody haven't seen that movie, it's a good one. Um, yeah. I mean, is this in the is this in the ten year plan, or is this more like, hey, if it happens, it happens? Yeah, I'm not too, you know. Right, right. And okay. if I have kids too, it's like, you know, whatever. I'll I'll just go yeah. with the flow. I mean. All right. I feel like I've been really blessed to be able to kind of pursue a lot of my own ideas of whatever the heck one could do in this life. And, you know, would, would that, by the way, I apologize if I'm getting too personal and I probably am, but oh, that's it's, what's it's making this podcast fun. Yeah, man. You gotta, you know, do you think you're too selfish to, to have a kid? No, not at all. I think my selfishness is a utility of, being successful as a creative person and it, and it goes to about that extent. Yeah. And um, I've reined it in for various relationships and various situations all the time. Um, but yeah, if, if I'm in a position where I have a clear, clear runway, I mean, yeah. I might as well delve into this stuff and try to make some shit happen. Probably, you know, you can relate. Like you've had times in your life where you're like, well, I can do whatever the heck I want to do. So I'm going to go do it. Cause if I do it well, it'll take care of other people. Yeah, for sure. Good. Yeah, man. Um, let me ask you this. <laughs> Is surfing an uninteresting topic from a filmmaker's or a storyteller's point of view? Is surfing boring? Um, I mean, what's interesting to anybody anymore? I don't even know. Like, what are, where are our attention spans? Like, in some ways, it's the most compelling thing ever without needing to instill any narrative into it because it's just a kinetic, beautiful dance, you know, with nature. So I think it's one, it's like simultaneously the most compelling and simultaneously like the least compelling if we're like trying to, to, sculpt some narrative around it yeah you know yeah i it's it's just you know the whole it's so cliche that it's kind of like first of all it's all been done before there's what what can we do that's that's new and frankly talking about sort of um you know commercialized surf culture is boring as all hell so yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just, I think the most interesting topic in surfing is people who quit surfing. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting things about surfing, and I don't know why it hasn't been done. Give me one. Let's hear a story. I have to, I'm going to hold those close to my chest because I might want to do them one day. All right. Fair enough. <laughs>
Um, I used to give away all my ideas on podcasts. Uh, you learned your lesson. Yeah, just, you know. Yeah. Share everything. But I know, I think that there's a lot of like, there's a lot of just nuts and bolts of surfing that's really rad. And I think that everybody's been trying to imbue it with some magical, mystical, romantic thing when it's really just people who are like coasting on the post World War II petrodollar supremacy of like having a lot of cash in other places and being able to party dump and do the best things in life. It's kind of devoid of like what humans have had to do for a long time. And that's like, there's nothing really pithy about that. It's just kind of a cool party and beautiful and awesome. And it's like a firecracker. It's like a firework show. It's like beautiful and ephemeral. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Tell me about, um, what are your thoughts on nu nuclear energy? Uh, I don't know. I don't know enough. I know that it's a, a complicated topic. I think that, yeah, there's just so many ways that we can make energy or we can do stuff that is a little smaller scale using the the radiation of the sun um not necessarily through photovoltaics like you know lithium extraction um and that's what really excites me it's just all these low-tech solutions that people can tinker with and fix themselves and isn't made overseas by like mining the desert or doing all these things and um I know that there's a lot of proponents of nuclear technology. I think it's obviously something that like quote unquote nuanced thinkers thinks has been given a bad rap. Um, I think that it's probably like anything. It's like, you know, talking about like veganism or vegetarianism, it's not the cow, it's the how. Um, but I think that there's a lot of like systemic issues around the way in which we make decisions in our country that has a pretty long track record of not considering local communities. <laughs> so under that like legacy, introducing something as powerful as nuclear technology is like kind of, I don't know, raises undemocratic. Some... Well, it just raises some red flags because, you know, we haven't, taken yeah. into consideration local communities of like where we put the waste and like how we build things and you're, still reinforce concrete and you know all yeah. that stuff you have a real jeffersonian sort of outlook like just you know small little communities and they control their their destiny well, is that is that fair mm, no i think there's a kind of yeah i don't know i think it's like I, I would describe myself as like a communist slash anarchist like i think the political sphere the, the the political landscape is more of a sphere and we're taught to think of like the front side which is like the marketed with all the hype around it and it's like corporatized and centralized and there's like the back side in which like unabomber shit meets <laughs> you know the most communist stuff ever and they're actually not that different it's just you're getting away from um corporately controlled interests in which wealthy individuals can lobby a million x their say on yeah. whatever they want and it's not really it's not really democracy it's yeah. not really like liberty I mean, we've lost what all those terms even mean we've lost what yeah. equality means like all those have become obfuscated i think through think tanks to try to confuse people and yeah and now we have technology that can like literally change the way we think about certain topics because it our brains are hackable by algorithms yeah that ai thing you put out on instagram was amazing man that was kind of both scary and i didn't know if it was sarcastic and i didn't know if the, <laughs> if the brands that you put in there were i I was, that's what, that's what got me. I, I got to talk to Cyrus. I haven't talked to Cyrus in a long time, but that <laughs> AI piece you put out, I was like, holy shit, this guy's a deep that thinker, was, man. 
That brought me in the door, huh? Okay. Yeah. Well, I've known that you're just a, a deep, sweet soul forever, but I mean, that one was like, I need to talk to Cyrus. That's some heavy shit. Oh, man. Well, look, I've asked a lot of you, and I appreciate your uh, candor. Um, it's been time, fun man. chatting with you. Um, we went in an area that neither of us thought we would go, and I'm so glad we did. And uh, I appreciate you, and thanks for being on the Boardroom Podcast with me. Oh, thanks, Scott, for having me on. I appreciate it. And let's surf sometime.